We are back and we are joined now by Richard Beck, senior writer at N Plus One magazine, author of the recent piece in the New Left Review, Biden is in the Broad. Uh, R- Richard also has a book uh, coming out in September called Homeland, The War on Terror in American Life. Richard, thanks so much for coming on the show today. Thanks for having me. So your your piece begins with reminding us, taking us back to uh, the lovely 2020 campaign where some of us had a lot of hope that was dashed quite quickly, um, where Biden had two central planks, really, that he centered his foreign policy promises around. Um, and that was a foreign policy for the middle class, which he talked about. That, and, and that was, I think, in keeping with his withdrawal of Afghanistan, that was part of how he branded it, right? And, and that was a good action that he took. Um, and then the other kind of ideological slogan was that it was democracies versus autocracies. Can you take us back to that moment and what, how those kind of two themes for his foreign policy got crafted? Yeah, so I think during... Uh you know, the, the Trump presidency, uh, you had these figures within the Democratic Party's foreign policy establishment, people who now occupy very prominent roles within the Biden administration, like Anthony Blinken and Jake Sullivan, mm-hmm. um, who spent those four years trying to come up with a foreign policy program uh, that could beat Trump in 2020. And the two planks or slogans that they arrived at, as you said, are a foreign policy for the middle class and autocracy versus democracy. Uh, The foreign policy for the middle class, I think it's important to remember that these two slogans were formulated in the context of how do we win a political campaign? Um, Because the idea wasn't specifically that every foreign policy action America took needed to actually help the American middle class. It was more that the U.S. would not undertake a foreign policy action under Biden unless it could say and plausibly argue that it would help the the middle class. So like you said, the withdrawal from Afghanistan, that is almost the entirety of how Biden sold that withdrawal. Why are we continuing to throw money away on this expensive conflict that's dragged on for for 20 years, that money should be reinvested at home, right? Uh, You know, and this is around the same time that he's pushing things like the Inflation Reduction Act uh, and this big infrastructure push, clean energy push. Um, So that that was the framing for selling foreign policy at home, which is important because foreign policy is often the part of what the federal government does, what the president does that, uh, you know, everyday voters feel the least connected to. Um, And then in terms of this autocracies versus democracies, that became very urgent uh, once Russia invaded the Ukraine. And when you think about Biden dividing the world into autocracies versus democracies, you can sort of read that as a metonym for countries that are aligned with the American led, you know, quote unquote, rules based international order and countries that oppose it. And I think the Biden administration viewed Russia's invasion of Ukraine as being incredibly high stakes for the future of that international order. Um, You've got numerous officials within the Biden administration saying when Putin invaded, if we don't stand up to Russia here, if Putin is able to succeed either by wiping out Ukraine or taking over large parts of it, the US led international order may be done. Like they saw that as an existential threat to US hegemony. And it, it's it was actually kind of a sufficient analysis for them at the time, I would say autocracy, autocracies versus democracies as it relates to Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine, right? Because it was straightforward in the sense where they could make the case Russia is an adversary of the United States. They're engaged in imperial illegal, uh, a, a, in, in imperial illegal invasion of Ukraine. Um, they are also not a very democratic country, and so it's kind of a clean branding proposition. But then October seventh hits, and we're in a bit of an issue, a situation where the cracks in that kind of black and white thinking about the world begin to make themselves incredibly obvious, which is that democracies when it co- when it expands outside of the 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 narrative surrounding Russia 
democracies versus autocracies, it's not quite clear because many autocracies are put in place in the ashes and in the embers or continued legacy of colonialism and uh, exploitation of the global south and other areas. And democracy, I'm noticing increasingly, from whether it be from Netanyahu or Biden, is basically being used as a stand-in to refer to Israel as you know, they're one of us, right? They're one of the white Western countries and they're civilized as opposed to the barbaric people on the other side or, you know, some of the other kind of uh, autocratic leaders in the Middle East who we very conveniently have propped up for our own interests. But let's not look at that at all. Let's just look at Israel as the only democracy in the Middle East. That is where I think you see this entire brand of viewing the world in this manner as opposed to one of, like, power and colonialism just entirely fall apart. Yeah, and I think that that was October 7 uh, and the Israeli assault on Gaza that followed has been um, a real disaster for the Biden administration, in part because the Biden administration very much hoped from the beginning of his presidency to keep the Middle East out of the headlines. Like that's also a part of uh, right. the withdrawal from Afghanistan. Uh, the idea was the US is no longer going to have this kind of direct military supervisory role in the region. Uh, we're going to hand off more of that responsibility to the reactionary governments who we are allied with in the region. And because we can hand off the direct supervision uh, more to places like Saudi Arabia, and we can get these countries to normalize relations with Israel. That was the whole idea behind the Abraham Accords, which Biden, which Trump, uh, the Trump administration, you know, kind of established, but Biden was very happy to pick that up and run with it. Um, the, he really wanted to pivot to focusing on China and focusing on Russia and to not have the Middle East and America's entanglements and support of uh, reactionary governments in the region be what people were thinking about every day. And once October 7 happened, that became impossible. Um, and we'll return, I think, to, to Israel-Palestine in, in a bit, but I did also want to talk about the China piece of this is because um, the US, U.S. empire and the foreign policy establishment has long wanted to pivot to China, right? And that has been discussed for, for decades at this point. But we were bogged down in the Middle East due to the endless war on terror. And um, that, I think, delayed this shift in terms of economic and military adversarial uh, posture towards China. Um, what has Biden's uh, position been just to recap and where does that kind of antagonism both economically and militarily stand as it relates to China? I think Biden's position with respect to China, um, it's interesting. It's basically in its broad strokes, it's been the same as Trump's. And I don't think that you could describe Trump when he was in office as having a long-term geostrategic plan for American competition with China. Trump, right, thinks purely transactionally in terms of what benefits him personally. If something makes him look or sound good on TV, he's going to do it. Like he doesn't he doesn't care about the long-term geostrategic ambitions of the United States. You know, but he started uh, one of his popular campaign slogans, you know, his topics that he would return to over and over again was about how China was ripping off the U.S. Uh, he's going to slap these tariffs on Chinese goods. Uh, China won't be able to continue, you know, invading the U.S. with its cheap consumer goods, all that kind of stuff. And when Biden took office, his administration basically said, we like a lot of what Trump did there. And again, we're going to pick that up and run with it. Um, so you've seen a lot of uh, what I would call fear mongering over something like TikTok, um, and, you know, as a Chinese owned social media platform. Uh, you've got the Biden administration's recent tariffs on Chinese electric vehicles. Um, the goal is, and Biden laid this out very specifically in his national security strategy, they see China as the only country in the world 
that can plausibly hope to compete with the U.S. economically. And they want to make sure that the U.S. stays on top of that competition. So is it fair to say that Biden's foreign policy is centered around preserving United States hegemony, um, even if that that hegemony has kind of been bleeding out slowly, I would argue, since the you know the beginning of the 21st century when uh the u.s empire kind of laid itself bare to uh the world with the illegal war in iraq yeah i think i think it's fair to see biden's foreign policy as defensive in that way the goal is to preserve what we have and actually i would locate the beginning of the decline or you know a crisis of american hegemony earlier than the beginning of the 21st century i think you can look back to uh, the 1970s when global growth begins to slow. And you know the US for several decades had been the leader of this world economic order that produced the most fantastic rates of economic growth that the world had ever seen. And at some point in the 1970s, that growth wave began to hit its limits and decade by decade over the last 50 years, average global growth has ticked down bit by bit, uh, you know, surely, but steadily, slowly, but steadily. Um, I think and I you guess can there was a, a, a temporary boom with like the the Silicon Valley kind of uptick, right? But even that is still a product that's not physical um, and, and almost right uh, separate from certain trade elements. Well, I think you can view the period from the 90s up until now you can see a few different attempts to juice growth, to get it back to where the U.S. thinks it needs to be in order for its hegemony to be secured again. And you have the dot-com boom of the 90s was uh, one of those growth waves. That ended spectacularly in right. 2000 with the dot-com crash. Um, you can look at the Federal Reserve's decision to keep interest rates basically at zero for almost 20 years as part of that, saying, well, growth seems to still be slowing. Let's make it as easy as possible for uh, companies to borrow money and move capital around. Uh, the housing boom of the 2000s is another instance of this kind of asset price inflation, where uh, <coughs> if we make home ownership available to many more people than previously, because housing is so, so labor intensive and mobilizes so many sectors of the economy, that's going to juice growth. And then that collapsed spectacularly in 2007, 2008. And now I think we're in the middle of a second uh, tech wave of trying to paper over the contradictions and the weaknesses of the US led economy with things like AI, where you have all of these fantastic promises being made that you sort of know at the outset can't ever be fulfilled, um, and certainly not on the scale that they're being, you know, uh, promised. Um, but I think that, uh, yeah, it, there's there's been this wave of successive attempts to kind of keep what America has, even as growth continues to slow bit by bit. And I also think that plays in then to U.S. military competition with China, because even if, as appears to be the case, we can't get global growth back to, you know, four or five percent annually. If the U.S. can hold on to a higher relative share of a slowing global growth pool, then it can still be the world's most powerful country, even if the economy as a whole continues to slow and fracture. And, and the defensive posture that you talk about that the Biden administration is taking <laughs> as it relates to foreign policy, I think is... Um, it's both defensive and then also, I would say, lacking in proactivity in terms of returning or restoring anything from the pre-Trump era, right? Where Trump thrashed about and did things, as you say, that were in his personal best interest or what he thought could appeal to, to the constituencies he wants to appeal to, like withdrawing from the Iran nuclear uh, peace deal. The Biden administration has not restored that, and it doesn't seem like there, there has been much movement on that. I mean, I'm hopeful when I see things like the fact that they've established these back channels to, say, not spark a massive regional war after Israel bombed um, their consulate in, I guess it was Damascus, right? But, um, you know, 
that means I guess they're communicating with Iran, but they haven't worked to restore um, those kind of more formal diplomatic relations. And on the side, they are so they haven't worked to restore the really good thing that the Obama administration did on this front, which was this peace deal. But they are working to further a Trump administration policy in the region, which is the Abraham Accords. Um, so it's both it's defensive, but the one, stuff that they're being proactive about as it relates to the Middle East is fairly far right stuff that actually really only boxes out other potential Arab partners or, or uh, any non any country in the Middle East that is not aligned with U.S. hegemony at this point. Yeah, I think that's, um, you know, in some respects, uh, the lack of really sustained engagement on Iran and reviving the nuclear deal. In some respects, I'm not inside the White House or anything, uh, but it, it seems to me like it might be a bandwidth issue, right? Like there's Russia, that's taking up a lot of everyone's time. Now there's Israel and Gaza, that's taking up a lot of everyone's time. Uh, China, they really feel they can't afford to put that off for another another presidential term, another two years, another four years. That's taking up a lot of everyone's time. There's only so much that a presidential administration can address uh, minute to minute. And the plans that the Biden administration did have for the Middle East up until October 7 have all potentially just been exploded. Um, so I think even there, uh, at this point, something like the Abraham Accords, and you know, the U.S. is still hoping that Saudi Arabia will agree to normalize relation its relations with Israel. Um, I think you could also see that as primarily defensive at this point. It's still in pursuit of this goal, kind of white knuckling it at this point. To you know, can we please focus on China and not have to spend every day working on these crises in the Middle East? A I but I don't understand that line of thought. I know that's not your line of thought, but it's still, it, it's white knuckling it, right? But how, how does that not further bog the United States down in the region in that way? Because we know that that was a part of Hamas's desperation on October 7th was the pursuant, uh, the, the, the fact that the White House, two consecutive White Houses have been pursuing this normalization deal with Saudi Arabia that doesn't even deal with Palestinian sovereignty. I don't necessarily have a, a comprehensive answer to that, um, as opposed in terms of the Biden administration's thinking. Um, you know, I would say that at this point, part of it is that when you know Biden came in, uh, Trump had already kickstarted the Abraham Accords. A lot of work had gone into it. You've got a lot of America's allies in the region who are excited about it and interested in pursuing it further. And to move away from that and to say, no, we're going to go all in on a diplomatic push to bring back the nuclear deal with Iran, that's a huge lift um, at a time when Biden really wants to be laser focused on Russia and on China. And I also think uh, it's plausible that Biden looked at what happened to the first version of the nuclear deal, which is that the instant a Republican uh, took office, it was gone. And I think they've got every reason to expect that even if they were able to renegotiate it and reestablish it, it would be painstaking, involve all kinds of politically costly concessions domestically. The second a Republican gets into office, it's gone again. Um, so I think by, you know, Biden has always described himself as someone who wants to work across the aisle. And I think that self-description is sincere. I think he was looking for a solution that Republicans wouldn't immediately dismantle the second one of them uh, got back in the White House and that trying to build on and strengthen the Abraham Accords uh, seemed like the better bet. Um, and. I guess just to return to where your your piece began, talking about Jake Sullivan and Blinken and some of the people that have staffed his foreign policy, Brett McGurk. Um, can you talk about their ideological kind of leanings, their history, and how they were essential to crafting this um, th this vision that I would argue is is collapsing in front of our eyes? 
Yeah, I think I think the the most important figure of the three, uh, as far as I can tell, is Jake Sullivan, who's been this up and coming, you know, wonderkin star within the Democratic Party for a while. And uh, I opened the New Left Review piece talking about a book by a journalist named Alexander Ward called The Internationalists, which is a kind of insider review of the Biden administration's foreign policy during the first two years of his term. And, you know, Ward is, a, is at Politico. He used to be at Vox. Uh, you know, he interned at the State Department, the Council on Foreign Relations. Like, he's very much within this mainstream of the Democratic Party as well. And he's almost smitten with Sullivan in the book. You know, he's quoting uh, a, Qu a Clinton loyalist describing him as a once in a generation talent. Um, there's kind of uh, somewhat fawning descriptions of him as uh, earlier in his career impressing the other staffers on Amy Klobuchar's Senate campaign with his ability to recall the lyrics to pop songs. Um, like he, he's just this, he's been this rising star for a while and again, he's one of the driving forces behind the slogan of foreign policy for the middle class. Um, and I don't think, I think Sullivan's intellectual acumen or ambitions uh, or his creativity have maybe get overstated a little bit in Ward's book, because it seems to me that what he's actually doing is coming up with a new way to package the old foreign policy, right? Which is just American hegemony forever. Um, right. And and packaging it in a way that is about defending democracy in, in that in in that brand, right? So I guess that's where I return to Israel Palestine. I mean, is it your view that this is a kind of a, a, a a deep threat to the branding for the Biden administration as a, a government that's attempting to support the democracies and, and the will of the people abroad versus governments behaving in an authorita uh, authoritarian manner. And I should say, I think that these I potential ICC arrest warrants for Netanyahu, when you put it next to the one for Putin, gives that con lays that contradiction pretty bare for the world. Yeah, I think... I think it's a disaster for America's image, you know, and self-image, let's say the federal government's self-image of the U.S. as a uh, as a promoter of human rights, as a defender of democracy, as uh, a supporter of a rules-based international order, because the Biden administration has made it perfectly clear since October 7 that none of the rules of the international order apply to Israel. Um, one of the State Department or Defense Department spokesmen, I forget who, but in the early stages of the war, kept saying repeatedly at press conferences, we're not drawing any red lines with respect to Israel. Okay, well, if the international rules-based order is real, there's red lines for everybody. That's what a rule is. Um, and the US has been very explicit that Israel can do what it wants. Um, and I don't think it's overstating things to say, you know, yes, Biden uh, makes these statements or has, you know, these leaks uh, to the press where an anonymous staffer just, you know, Biden is always being described as very frustrated with Israel, very angry with Netanyahu. You know, they're very concerned about reports that they've seen. Um, this hasn't resulted in any of the concrete action that could meaningfully restrain Israel militarily in its conflict, like cutting off weapons in a real way. Um, the U.S. is trying to muddle through and hoping that Israel can essentially get away with it because Israel is America's most important ally in the region. Um, and it is the single most important guarantor of U.S. Uh, control over the region. And if this plan to step back from a direct supervisory role is to succeed, then not just Israel, but a belligerent Israel still needs to be in place. And if Israel were to face serious consequences for this war, if someone like Netanyahu were to be arrested and, you know, brought before The Hague, that would be the end of 
the kind of belligerence that Israel has been accustomed to and that the U.S. has counted on um, for many decades. When do you see that turning? When, like, the military intelligence, the strategic geopolitical uh, benefits of having Israel so closely tied to the United States, the intelligence sharing, when did the benefits of that outweigh the the cost? Because I'm hoping that's soon. <laughs> you know, I don't, um, I don't, I don't know, uh, is the simple, you know, sort of stupid, but true version of the answer. Um, I do hold out some hope that in terms of uh, the election this fall. I, I hope very much that there's some urgency, even if it's self-interested within the Biden administration that says we cannot be having this kind of death and destruction flashed across everybody's television and computer and phone screens in August and September. Um, it's going to alienate too many of the voters who Biden needs if he wants to beat Trump. You know, on the other hand, they're balancing that against the fact that, like, Trump is a weak candidate and he's not very well liked and he's currently on trial. Uh, he's got other trials pending. Um, they're really, really trying to thread a needle here. Uh, what I will say in the interim, you know, I don't know that there will necessarily be a turning point. But in terms of America's ability to, you know, command the compliance of the rest of the world, you know, there was a quote from a piece in the Financial Times several months ago uh, where someone at some international economic conference just said, the U.S. has lost the global south forever, right? Um, you know, the global south was already moving uh, away from the U.S., you know, in tentative ways deepening its relationships with China, particularly economically with China's Belt and Road Initiative. And I think what's happened in uh, Gaza uh, since October 7 is only going to accelerate uh, that trend. Um, well, uh, hopefully that's the case. <laughs> um, Richard Beck, uh, the piece is called Bidenism Abroad and New Left Review. And the book that is coming out in September is entitled Homeland, The War on Terror in American Life. Thanks so much for your time today, Richard. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Hey, folks, don't forget to hit the subscribe button and check out our daily show. We do it every day at 12 p.m. Eastern for about two and a half hours. We even take phone calls. You should check that out.